Thank you. Uh, and uh, next we're going to have uh, Mark Flood from uh, the University of Maryland. He's going to talk about uh, OTC markets. Thank you. Uh, and this is uh, joint work with uh, Jonathan Simon uh, from University of Iowa and uh, Matthew Tim from Bradley University. Uh, and we got started on this uh, project uh, actually years ago uh, at a math finance conference uh, in the wake of the financial crisis. <clears throat> and uh, I personally, uh, I was working on systemic risk issues at the time, uh, um, and I was <clears throat> um, irked by the, the fact that there were a lot of folks uh, in the policy debate whose uh, um, uh, expertise I really respected who said that a key uh, portion of uh, the problem was that the system was too complex. Uh, and uh, uh, nobody specified really what they meant by complex. And, and, uh, and that frustrated me. I, I wanted to, um, uh, to, to put some content behind this. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the, uh, what I'm going to do in the talk here is uh, uh, three things. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give you the, uh, the broad intuition here for uh, how we're thinking about the problem. Uh, and then we're going to uh, um, uh, take that broad intuition to the specifics of the corporate bond market and, and look at how you might implement uh, these ideas uh, in that context. And then finally, uh, um, uh, and, and, and this is sort of an exploratory uh, project for us, uh, we're going to take those measures of complexity in the corporate bond market uh, and try to connect them to uh, um, something from the financial realm that we know that we care about, which is, uh, um, uh, in this case, market liquidity, and, and see is, uh, is there any uh, um, financial empirical content to what we're doing. Uh, so uh, the gist of the intuition uh, is that complexity emerges from relationships among relationships in, in uh, network systems. and. Uh, <clears throat> Um, I came up with this cartoonish example because I knew I wasn't going to have time to, to really get into it, but Mateus gave me a great uh, um, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> applied example from the repo market uh, that, that, that uh, provides some of the intuition as well. The basic idea is we've got Bob and Alice, uh, um, and, and they form a simple network because Alice lends to Bob, um, so we've got two nodes, one edge. <clears throat> Uh, but it turns out uh, Alice doesn't have the resources to, to create the loan himself. Um, he's got to fund the loan some, from somewhere. And so uh, <clears throat> Alice uh, uh, has two choices. He can borrow from uh, either Dumbledore or Snidely, Snidely Whiplash. <clears throat> and uh, the key uh, <clears throat> aspect of this decision is that the behavior of Dumbledore and Snidely differs dramatically. So uh, um, Dumbledore is honest and righteous and respects the rule of law. <clears throat> and <clears throat> If Alice borrows from Dumbledore, uh, there's no real uh, connection between the two loan contracts. The two edges we can uh, treat as independent of each other. Uh, um, there, there's no uh, behavioral feedback. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, uh, so, so uh, in, uh, uh, for example, if Bob defaults on the loan to Alice, uh, then Alice turns around to Dumbledore and says, uh, I, I can't pay you or I'm going to be paying late. <clears throat> And they'll work it out. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, Alice gets the funding from Snidely, um, Snidely is evil and, 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 and deranged. <clears throat> um, if Bob comes to Alice and says, we're paying late, Alice goes to Snidely and says, we're paying late. Snidely kills Alice um, as a message to Bob that you better pay up, right? Um, and so there is this uh, <clears throat> um, behavioral element uh, in the network that's not recorded in the data. The data tell us certain key facts about what's going on, uh, but <clears throat> there's an important dimension uh, to the problem that's not recorded directly in the data. You've got to understand the, the, the sort of substance and nuance <clears throat> of these markets, how the participants are going to behave. And that's where the uh, <clears throat> um, market-specific modeling comes in. So uh, um, to, to make these things interesting, uh, you're always augmenting the network data with uh, um, uh, <clears throat> models of institutional constraints and, and, and participant behavior. All right, that's the basic idea. Um, we are looking for relationships between relationships as a source of complexity. Uh, <clears throat> this is particularly important for us uh, um, in attacking complexity because <clears throat> relationships between relationships can create uh, recursive behavior, feedback effects, spillover effects uh, that may not scale uh, um, linearly. They, they, they may scale uh, exponentially and, and, and often in bad ways. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, all right, so uh, um, yeah, uh, let's go to the, <clears throat> the data. Um, uh, don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide just to say that we've uh, applied this basic principle in uh, a couple of other contexts. We, uh, we've looked at the credit default swap market uh, and, and the London Whale episode in particular. We've also applied it uh, to uh, bank holding company hierarchies and the complexity of resolution uh, in the event of failure. And we're also working on a monograph for SIAM on, on these topics, which uh, um, will uh, hopefully be coming out next year. All right, this is the, uh, the data we're dealing with. Uh, so the, um, the trade reporting and compliance uh, <clears throat> engine from the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority uh, <clears throat> since 2002 has collected uh, uh, data on all corporate bond transactions in the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> the gist of the reporting is that there are uh, <clears throat> a defined set of market participants, that's what the regulator calls them, um, we're gonna call them dealers, uh, <clears throat> And any time a dealer engages in a corporate bond transaction, they have to report uh, to FINRA within 15 minutes. There's a, some reporting software. The back office has to type in the details. <clears throat> and FINRA learns uh, what was the, the time of the transaction, who traded with whom, uh, um, uh, what, bond, uh, what bonds uh, was, was traded, um, uh, how many of those bonds were traded, and what was the price. And there's a couple of dozen other uh, <clears throat> interesting attributes that collected, uh, get collected as well. That's the, uh, uh, the gist of our data source. <clears throat> if uh, on a typical trading day, uh, there will be on the order of 70,000 bond transactions uh, in, in the market. Uh, and they will cover uh, on the order of 7,000 distinct uh, uh, bonds or QCIPs. Uh, um, QCIP is the, uh, the identifier. Uh, um, and so uh, to, to look at the full network, uh, you quickly run into a hairball problem. Uh, but what we're, uh, what we're gonna do is uh, shatter the, the, the daily network into QCIP specific networks. Um, and that's what you see here. This is a uh, particular bond. Um, we're, we're looking at a, a snapshot of a single trading day in 2016. Uh, the bond is uh, uh, a non-callable uh, debenture for Bank of America Corporation at two and five eighths percent. Uh, it matured uh, in uh, 2020. And on this particular day, uh, um, there were 58 transactions in that bond uh, among uh, 22 distinct dealers. And uh, significantly, uh, a lot of those transactions are, are not dealer to dealer. Uh, they will be dealer to customer. So the, <clears throat> the dealers are identified individually, but the customers show up in the data as just uh, an anonymous blob. Um, and uh, we've taken the anonymous blob and split it into two components, the customers who happen to buy and the the, the blob that happened to sell that day. Uh, so, um, and also, uh, um, we're, we're gonna look at the uh, um, sample daily data uh, from 2003 to 2018. Um, that gives us on the order of 1.6 million shards, uh, um, uh, specific networks like this. Um, we're going to uh, throw away uh, a large proportion of the sample because we have plenty of data. Uh, and so any shard that involves fewer than 15 dealers, uh, we're going to discard as, as just being too, uh, too sparse to, to be interesting. Uh, we still have a lot of data. Uh, <clears throat> all right, we're interested in relationships among relationships. Uh, a key uh, um, uh, the trick that we're using here is we're going to apply the, uh, the line graph. Um, uh, um, I had certainly never heard of a line graph be, be, before we got into this, but the, the gist of the line graph is a very simple transformation. So you start with uh, uh, a graph uh, like the one I just showed you. And what we're going to do is we're going to convert the edges in the graph into nodes in, in, in a new graph, the line graph. Uh, and so for, for each edge in the original graph, we drop in a, one of those blue ellipses. Uh, that's gonna be a node in the line graph. And then the, these nodes in the line graph 
get connected if they share a node in the original graph. So that node and that node get connected because they, they pass through, uh, I guess, dealer one there. Um, so uh, this is the, the line graph for the, the, this dealer shard that I just showed you. Uh, and one way to, uh, to think about the line graph is uh, um, <clears throat> use a, as, as a metaphor, uh, think of uh, uh, Canadian Tire, which is a, 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 um, a bunch of retail outlets, in the, but then they've got warehouses across the country and uh, um, they're interested in where their, uh, their inventory is held and, and occasionally they have to ship inventory from one, one warehouse to another. This is Canadian Tire's view of the world. Um, they're, they're focused on uh, the warehouses uh, as the location of inventory, and then occasionally the stuff gets shipped around and uh, they have to track the details, but the, 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 the nodes are the um, uh, centerpiece of interest. Um, <clears throat> in the line graph, same situation, but think of the uh, um, a multi multimodal uh, shipping company that's servicing Canadian Tire and moving the stuff between the warehouses. The shipping company uh, doesn't really care so much while the st where the stuff is in the warehouse. Um, they care, um, is it on my truck? Is it on my train? Is it on my boat? <clears throat> and so uh, the nodes here are the transportation events and the edges are storage events. So it, it's the same information just presented in, in a different, uh, uh, different fashion. Um, and you'll see that we've got the, the last number up there is 58. There are 58 transactions, so there are 58 nodes in the line graph. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, um, uh, good for us because, again, we're interested in relationships among relationships. The, <clears throat> um, uh, the original relationships are the, uh, the transactions from that dealer graph that I just showed you, and the line graph is connecting those relationships in a very explicit way. Uh, all right. <clears throat> now comes the, the, the content where we, we, we step beyond the data and, and add some, uh, some structure. So we're going to uh, um, play with the line graph. We're going to isolate uh, um, a handful of specific motifs, behavioral motifs in the line graph. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll start with the off-diagonal elements here. Um, down here and up here. Uh, <clears throat> in both of these uh, pictures, you've got a little motif, uh, a triad from the dealer graph, uh, and then its corresponding representation in what we're going to call the intermediation graph. So <clears throat> this motif uh, is an intermediation. You've got uh, um, dealer X is acting as an intermediary. Uh, uh, dealer X participates as the buyer in deal B and the seller in deal A uh, and, and sort of uh, is just the, the middleman passing it through. So we're going to look for, for those sorts of patterns uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, they can go either way. So uh, uh, both uh, these off diagonal motifs uh, are, are intermediation events. <clears throat> and then uh, the, al the alternative motifs are X uh, <clears throat> serves as a, uh, a focal point for incoming uh, uh, inventory or uh, um, uh, the, uh, the starting point for inventory dispersal. Um, we call that the, the fan in and the fan out graphs. Uh, <clears throat> applying this to uh, the, the same shard that I showed you before, uh, uh, intermediation graph looks like this. <clears throat> An additional bit of filtration that we do uh, is uh, um, uh, applying a, a contemporaneity window. So how close together in time do these transactions have to occur for us to, to consider them? So uh, um, uh, uh, a one minute window corresponds to sort of a standard uh, definition of what's called a riskless principal trade, where uh, the inventory comes into the dealer portfolio and goes out again within 60 seconds. Uh, um, uh, the second uh, window is the trace reporting window, which I mentioned is within 15 minutes. They have to report to the regulator. Uh, so we uh, um, uh, uh, 
we, we, we try things with that window. Actually, everything I'm going to show you is with the 15-minute window. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, lastly, we, here, here it is with 150 minutes, two and a half hours. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, just to show you how the, um, uh, the transactions start to cluster uh, into larger components as, as the window gets bigger. Uh, here's what the fan in graph uh, looks like. Uh, for the fan in and fan out graphs, we've dropped the customer trades. Uh, um, so if you go back here, you'll see customer buyer is a major fan in point, customer seller is a major fan out point. Uh, those uh, uh, <clears throat> those nodes would um, really dominate the, the fan in and fan out graph, so we just drop them from the analysis uh, and, and look only at the interdealer uh, trades. And now, based on, on that, uh, we're going to calculate uh, complexity. Uh, just very simple uh, uh, network statistics, uh, the size uh, of uh, the, the giant component, um, the number of uh, um, connected components. Uh, uh, for the dealer graph, we're going to look at the number of uh, independent cycles. Uh, and for the uh, uh, intermediation fan, fan, fan in and fan out graphs, we're going to look at the number of edges. Uh, uh, and we're also going to, uh, to prepare for the statistical analysis. We're going to bucket these things into uh, um, five buckets based on the dollar volume uh, of trading in each bond. So we'll, we'll have uh, um, uh, <clears throat> a quintile of low volume bonds, a quintile of high volume bonds, and then three quintiles in the middle. Uh, and uh, the only thing I'll, I'll point out here, so this is the, um, the, the 12 uh, complexity metrics. <clears throat> as, the, as the volume goes from low to high, the complexity measures respond. So uh, the more volume there is, the, the more interesting things happen in, uh, in, in terms of complexity. <clears throat> now we're going to try to connect this to liquidity metrics. Uh, um, uh, couple of uh, um, very simple metrics of market activity, uh, but we're going to focus on uh, these two uh, um, uh, standard metrics from the finance literature, Ami Hood's uh, um, uh, price impact, uh, which looks at <coughs> um, the absolute return open to close over the course of the day divided by dollar volume, and the Corbin and Schultz look at the, the, the high-low range over the course of the day. Um, uh, how much price volatility there is. Um, and again, we're going to put those in the same five buckets so we can <clears throat> do the statistical analysis. Um, uh, these are summary stats for uh, the liquidity metrics. Again, we're going to um, focus on the price impact metrics from the, the finance literature. <clears throat> and the last step then is to do a Granger causality analysis. So uh, we want to know, we, we've devised uh, these complexity metrics. Uh, we think they're interesting, uh, but we want to know, uh, is there empirical content that would be relevant uh, <laughs> to financial analysis? And so our first step here uh, is uh, to uh, basically correlate uh, <clears throat> the complexity metrics uh, so the, the first two rows and columns in each of these uh, um, uh, four tables uh, are the liquidity metrics. The rest of these are complexity metrics. <clears throat> uh, and uh, um, a, a cell in uh, these tables is highlighted in green if the Granger causality is significant. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and the way it works is if a, uh, so, so that cell is green. That's the uh, the size of the average uh, um, maximum connected component in the dealer graph. Uh, <clears throat> um, Granger causes uh, the the corresponding row variable. So what we're seeing here is uh, um, the complexity in the dealer graph is Granger causing Emmy Hood liquidity, uh, which means that. <clears throat> In a one step ahead forecast, if you include uh, um, uh, complexity in your forecasting tool, then uh, um, complexity will help you significantly in forecasting liquidity in, in the next period. 
So uh, <clears throat> um, we, we split the data into uh, four samples. Uh, first four-year sample, 2003 to 2006, is sort of the um, uh, liquidity paradox uh, or volatility paradox episode. Uh, then uh, the crisis episode, there is a lot of uh, uh, interesting Granger causality stuff going on. Uh, um, uh, this is the post-crisis recovery austerity period, and this is the um, sort of zero lower bound period in the lead up to uh, the pandemic. And um, that's all I got, ready for, for questions.